But last time I was here, uh, I talked about the five hindrances. And uh, on my way over that day, I started thinking about that a little bit. And uh, this sutra came to mind. It was one in which the Buddha is having a conversation with a wandering ascetic. There were these guys that would kind of travel around and, and meditate and practice asceticism. And I like this particular one because the Buddha uh, is talking to this ascetic who's asking all these kind of metaphysical questions about the nature of the cosmos and things like that. And the Buddha just keeps saying, I don't teach that stuff. I teach suffering and the end of suffering. I teach how to, how to stop coming back to the cycle of stress. But then the discourse ends with a description of the mental processes that are required for enlightenment to happen, for, the, for this rounds of suffering to come to an end. And the Buddha actually doesn't give that part of the discourse. His cousin Ananda is there. I guess the Buddha had other stuff to do, so he left and left Ananda to talk to this ascetic. And Ananda says this, he says, all those who will be liberated do so after having abandoned the five hindrances, those defilements of awareness that weaken discernment, having well established their minds on the four frames of reference and having developed the seven factors of awakening. So abandon the five hindrances to meditation and the five hindrances to spiritual progress establish the four foundations of mindfulness, and then develop the seven factors of awakening, the seven factors of enlightenment. So I was thinking about this on the way over here that day, and I thought well, it would be nice to do a series of talks that, based on this, because it's kind of a comprehensive guide to mental development. If you did all those things, you'd make some pretty significant progress in your spiritual life. So I'm gonna go through and unpack those one at a time later, but I thought today I'd give you a little bit of a preview about the idea of enlightenment and those seven factors that Ananda was talking about. You know, it's, <laughs> there's a song by George Harrison that says something like, if you, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Um, I think it'd be nice to kind of have a sense of where you wanna go. So today we can talk about these seven factors of awakening and, um, and, then, and then we'll look at how to get there. So not long ago, I was having a conversation with a friend and he mentioned something that a child had said and it was during the holidays and family get togethers and all of that. And this little boy had noticed that uh, when he went into his room and turned the lights out, that after a little while, his eyes would get used to the darkness and he could start to see and he said, uh, you know, there's quite a bit of light in the dark. And I thought that's a nice metaphor for the idea of spiritual practice. You know, people tend not to start out on a spiritual path until they realize things have gotten a little dark. I don't think anybody ever wakes up on a Sunday morning and goes, gosh, it's a really nice day and everything is just going so well in my life. I think I'll start a spiritual path usually happens when we wake up and we realize that things are not going well. And so we want to look for solutions to those problems. So when we start coming to a place like this and we start practicing, we realize that there's a lot of light in that darkness, that there's light available to us, the light of hope, the light of goodwill, and things like that. And so it's kind of up to us to reveal that light and feed, make that light a little brighter. The Buddha himself started out on his spiritual journey after he realized that his life and the lives of his loved ones would contain stress, would contain suffering. And so he left the householder life and he practiced for several years and then eventually awoke to a path of freedom. And we call that awakening his enlightenment, sort of bringing light to the darkness of human experience. But when he talked about what he did to be enlightened, he spoke in terms of these specific factors, these seven things, mindfulness, keen investigation of the Dharma, effort, happiness, calm, concentration, and equanimity. 
So a lot of the time when we come to a spiritual practice, we look at this idea of enlightenment and think of it as something that happens to us. You know, we, we sit and meditate long enough and all of a sudden we're awake. But if you look at these seven factors and you look at the way the Buddha talked about them, you find that it's really more like something that we do. So the first one, mindfulness. This word mindfulness gets used a lot today in different contexts. Buddhist contexts and secular too. And you could say that mindfulness means being aware of what's going on in the, in the present moment. But that doesn't mean that it's enough to just sort of be in the moment, to sort of be here now. I mean, that's part of it. But you also need to be aware of what you're doing mentally, verbally, and physically. And really to awaken to the full impact and importance of your actions. So this light that shines in the darkness, this realization that we don't have to continue making ourselves and others unhappy, that we can come out into the light by retraining the mind, that's where mindfulness comes in, this awareness of what we're doing, it's bringing forth the light or increasing the dark. And then the second characteristic is keen investigation of the Dharma. Dharma is an interesting word. When we talk about Dharma in here, a lot of the time we talk about the teachings of the Buddha. Dharma also means law, uh, not, not law like, like, um, uh, like legal laws, statutes and that kind of thing, but law like laws of physics, how, how the nature of the universe works. And Dharma also means reality, a phenomenon, kind of what, what exists. And so by keen investigation of the Dharma, the Buddha meant that we need to kind of make it a point to understand reality as it is, which means looking more deeply into phenomena until we understand that the universe is constantly changing. And all phenomena, all, everything that arises due to causes and conditions are subject to, uh, to change, to the effect of actions. So one of the first things that we have to do when we start to do this is to stop clinging to the ways that we define ourselves and other selves and the sort of the goodness and badness of things and conditions. So part of this process of enlightenment means to understand this, understand that things are just the way they are. We can love them, we can hate them, but if we get disturbed, it's our doing. And it's the same with our bodies, our minds, our moods, and so on. We should see those as impermanent, as not really ours, not self. And it's stressful, and that's it. So we, we stop making judgments, we stop doing the judging, because we realize that it's just not worth the, the effort. There's a saying in uh, Japanese Buddhism that when you're enlightened, the trees and rocks are enlightened too. Trees and rocks don't change because you wake up, but you see the world differently because you, start, uh, because you start to awaken that awareness of things as they are. So everything is just as it should be. So that's the suchness. So the third factor, energy, that refers to really making a conscious, serious effort to follow the Buddhist path, to do these things, to wake up. The Buddha's example serves as a, an object of faith, an object of refuge. But he told us to be islands unto ourselves, to be our own refuge. So it's up to us to travel the path. He gave the talks, he left the teachings, but we have to do the work. So to, uh, to in, become enlightened, to wake up, means that we have to make a sincere effort to let go of harmful thoughts that have arisen to prevent the arising of more harmful thoughts, to develop thoughts that are good and helpful, <clears throat> and to promote the growth of good things that already exist in our hearts. So this means not only being mindful of understanding of what's going on, but to be diligent. So you think about the Buddha, uh, you know, at the end of this uh, several years of ascetic practice that he did, he sat down under a tree uh, and he, he made this vow, I'm not gonna get up. He said, my, my blood may dry up and my bones crumble to dust, but I'm not gonna rise again unless I'm awakened. 
So that's pretty serious. That's a pretty serious effort. So for us, that means really making a, a strong commitment to doing two things. First, letting go of the ways that we create difficulties for ourselves and others, and then cultivate the ways that we create happiness and freedom for ourselves and others. So the fourth factor of awakening is happiness. Um, and happiness is, it's kind of a, happiness is kind of a vague term. The term the Buddha used is, uh, the Pali word is piti, P-I-T-I. Um, we tend to think of happiness as being something that kind of arises as a result of uh, getting what we want. Uh, but th this particular kind of happiness is different from that. It comes from within, it's available to us in the present moment, and it's free from any clinging. And we actually can cultivate this in meditation. And you'll have this experience of a happiness that, that comes about when you stop wanting stuff, you stop clinging to things. And this happiness naturally arises in the heart, comes from within. And this kind of happiness is something that we have to do. It's not something we get, it's something we do. And we cultivate it in part by learning the, to recognize the difference between pleasure and happiness. Pleasant feelings, the kind of happiness that you get from you know, a, a really nice meal or listening to good music or whatever, whatever gives you pleasure, those things are momentary and fleeting. It's okay to enjoy them. You should enjoy every moment. But you don't l let this kind of happiness depend on externals. The fifth uh, factor of enlightenment is calm. And by this we mean tranquility of body and mind. This is the kind of calmness that arises because our minds are well trained and sort of orderly. And very closely related to that is concentration. You could say calmness and concentration really go hand in hand. Think of concentration as being a sort of steadiness of mind. Concentrated mind stays balanced, stays steady, even when hindrances arise. And this steadiness leads to a deeper calmness. So when you sit down to meditate and you, uh, you focus your attention on your breath, which is the instruction we give here, then that, if you can keep your mind steady on your breath, then your breath and your body are gonna become calmer and your mind becomes calmer. And as the breath and body and mind become calmer, the concentration actually becomes easier. So the more you concentrate, the calmer you get. The calmer you get, the more concentrated your attention becomes. The final factor of enlightenment is equanimity. And that really means uh, being able to encounter difficulties and changes without letting the mind waver. The mind becomes kind of like a spinning gyroscope. This isn't a passive thing, this equanimity. It's a very active thing. You know what a gyroscope is, right? Or a, a, a top, like a child uses, it spins. And because of that spinning, it becomes stable. Um, it can keep its balance no matter what you do. If you've got a gyroscope spinning in the palm of your hand, you can move it all over the place, then it stays upright. And it's kind of the same thing with the mind. You keep you keep this calmness and concentration cycle going. You keep uh, sort of turning the wheel of reality in your heart. And as long as you do that, you can stay balanced. So equanimity doesn't mean being indifferent. It means acceptance. It means understanding karma and how that comes into play. So if you understand cause and effect, you see reality the way it is and all of the things like shoulds and shouldn't start to fall away. So there's this concept that you start hearing about in Buddhism, Buddha nature. That's sort of like the light that exists in the darkness. And you'll hear that the goal of practice is to reveal this innate quality, the sort of true nature. But really, what does it mean to have Buddha nature? It means that we, like the Buddha, have the potential to wake up. It's the awareness that we have the choice, moment by moment, to move towards spiritual freedom. 
So I hope as we continue, uh, as I do this series, uh, uh, sort of unpack these factors of enlightenment and the hindrances and the foundations of mindfulness that you'll stick with me. And thank you very much for your attention.